Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. We're doing something a little different on today's episode of Free Thoughts. Here at Cato, several of us have a book club that gets together every couple of weeks to discuss classic works of libertarian theory. And today we're going to talk about one of the essays that we read for that book club. Uh, to, to do this, we're welcoming back our colleague Jason Kuznicki, a research fellow at Cato and editor of Cato Unbound. Today we're going to be talking about Auburn Herbert's essay, The Ethics of Dynamite. Herbert was a, a British writer who lived from 1838 to 1906. He was also a member of the House of Commons for four years in the 1870s. Today, he's known mainly as a libertarian activist and a proponent of voluntarism, which was the idea that the only legitimate form of the state is one that sticks to protecting our rights but is also funded through purely voluntary means. So it can't, it can't tax us. It only gets the money that people are willing to hand it. And so this, this particular essay of Herbert's was published in 1894. The essay is called The Ethics of Dynamite and it discusses a phenomenon that was uh, very much in the news at the time known as anarchism. And uh, this is a, a bit of a confusing term because today we might think of anarchism as mostly a philosophical position, position that government is morally illegitimate. Well, at least libertarians would think of it that way. Libertarians a lot of people would, would just yes. say anarchism to say want to want to destroy stuff, or or that there ought to be no government, or we might say there's a state of anarchy in which there is no government. But what anarchism was used to mean back then was something a lot closer to what we today would call terrorism. Uh, anarchists were people who bombed public buildings, who aimed to cause terror or, or suffering uh, in public in a way that would they hoped bring people around to, to their philosophical or political position, which very frequently was some form of collectivism or some form of socialism. And, and they did uh, in going into the 20s too, particularly they bombed Wall Street in a very – they bombed the LA Times, the Sacco and Vanzetti case were tied up, the Palmer raids. Uh, they definitely uh, self-proclaimed anarchists or accused anarchists did do a lot of destruction up into the, the 1930s almost. Well, and they still do today in some forms in their – you know, WTO, WTO protest. Yeah. Hmm. Now, what this is is obviously it's a thing that respectable people can't favor. No one is going to say, "Hey, let's bomb stuff uh, you know, to prove a point." Uh, the question then is, well, why is it worth talking about? Why are we why are we here talking about about uh, the ethics of dynamite? And uh, Oberon Herbert says, I detest dynamite because it is most treacherous, cruel, and altogether abominable. And he adds, I also detest it for other special reasons. And these other special reasons are really the core of the essay. Uh, this, is, this is why uh, he finds it actually worth talking about as opposed to just being random violence. He adds that dynamite is what he calls a 19th century development in the art of governing. And thus, it's not really anarchistic after all. It's not about anarchy. It's about force. Which is also what government which is. Which is also what government is. Which is ultimately the, the takeaway from this essay. We'll give spoilers right up front. Well, he because, gives them up front pretty quickly. Yeah. Is that there's not there, – there's a lot of similarities between the way that states operate and the kinds of things that states do – uh, and the way that they get us to obey them and what the dynamiter is out there doing. Well, here's, here's uh, Herbert's words. Dynamite is not opposed to government. It is, on the contrary, government in its most intensified and concentrated form. Whatever are the sins of everyday governmentalism, however brutal in their working, some of the great force machines with which we love to administer each other may tend to be, however reckless we may be as regards to each other's rights and our effort to place the yoke of our own opinions upon the neck of others, dynamite administers, with quotes, with a far ruder, rougher hand than ever the worst of the continental bureaucracies. So it's pretty clear that uh, that he views dynamite as 
a type of governing, which would probably offend many people today. It, it certainly would. And the obvious uh, sort of non-libertarian objection to this is that governments are morally legitimate and that when they do use force, that force is justified in some way. And uh, he goes on to attack certain of those justifications, by no means all of them, because logically you can't, you can't knock down every single uh, possible justification. But he does say, look, uh, if you are going to resort to force, you have to answer the problem of natural right. That is that when you coerce someone, you do in, in fact uh, attack their, their rights. You, you, you impose yourself over their rights and uh, doing that by, say, majority vote does not work for him. He finds that not to be a sufficient justification. Uh, how is it that – uh, how is it that a, a natural right can be defeated in essence by math, he asks. Multiplication, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, he says, uh, is it possible to suppose without absurdity that a man should have no rights over his own body and mind and yet have a one ten millionth share in unlimited rights over all other bodies and minds? If he does not begin by possessing rights over himself, by what wonderful flying leap can he arrive at rights over others? That is to say, if you're a citizen in a democratic polity, you are uh, going to have political rights over others. If you can form a, a majority coalition in that polity, then uh, yes, you, you may say you know, procedurally, I have the power to do this. Uh, Herbert's objection to that is, well, morally, you still have a problem. You have not defeated rights just by – by force of greater number. Yeah, and I find that um, I liked that he brought that up because it's an argument that I I've made often that there's an inconsistency in the suppositions that undergird majorities because you you do majorities by counting people, right? You don't you don't measure everyone's height and see you know the tallest group of people get to rule over the other people because it is the unit of the person that matters in choosing and creating a majority. So if it is the unit of the person that justifies a majority, how can or or when can and how can possibly a majority override the very thing that it justifies its existence if it has power at all? And yet this this seems I mean for a lot of people it's kind of a counterintuitive, right? Because there's this sense that majorities, you know, you, if we're deciding what we're going to – a group of friends are going to decide what to go, do for dinner, you know, we we vote and you kind of if, – if you're the guy who wanted Italian and everyone else wants Chinese, you know, you, you go along with mm -hmm. the, the Chinese. You don't like kind of – hold out and insist, well, I'm going to go off to have Italian on my own or whatever. Well, you could. You, you could. could and but, also but we'd, we'd look – you know, we'd be like that's a little bit – Odd. That's a little bit odd, behavior. but if I were deathly allergic to seafood and sure. the majority wanted to go out to a seafood restaurant, I might say, well, wait a minute, I'm not going to follow you. Right, but I guess it, it just for – I mean quite a lot of people, there isn't something immediately obviously morally wrong about majority rule. Oh, I think and, – yeah. And there's also the idea also that, that if, we, if we have to make decisions somehow, um, then – that's probably the most legitimate way as opposed to measuring height or something else. And there are certainly, there are certainly great advantages to, to democracy. I don't mean to say that, that uh, this critique of democracy means we should have no democracy whatsoever. Uh, I do think that democracy is great for doing things like selecting individuals to hold public office or uh, settling questions that uh, otherwise are, are – are you know, very difficult to resolve in, in like manner. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, say, disposing of an individual's property, then it begins to look less like democracy and more like, uh, more like mob rule. Uh, when, it, when it begins to in, in, interfere with individual autonomy and individual lives, uh, then it's, it's got a problem. Right. So when we're overriding rights with it, because then that's where we get back to it looks like the dynamiter mm -hmm. um, in that – the dynamiter is simply substituting his desires in a extremely violent way for those of the people he blows up or the property owners of you know shops he destroys or whatever um, and the political majorities are doing something quite similar if especially if they're overriding rights is they're just they're taking their whatever their preferences or whatever their interests are and just saying mind trump and they're, but they're giving – I mean unlike the dynamiter um, who is very direct 
both in that. Yeah, both no, in his no methods trappings and of in power. His, yeah, no, that's no just horns, like horns, no no uh, I, inauguration ceremonies. Right. I get what I want and I'm going to blow you up if, you know, to get it. Um, the the majorities in the state have these kind of elaborate stories to tell about how this same application of force um, is is made better by this math that he questions. Now, if I could just uh, dissent a tiny bit from from Oberon Herbert here, uh, I might say that the trappings of power and the elaborate stories and the rituals and the regularity of democratic governance are actually really important because uh, they do tend to prevent the state from acting like dynamiters in the worst sense of that. Uh, uh-huh. uh, the, you know, this, the state's violence does get limited by all of those things. Even if you have an absolute monarchy, if you have traditions that limit that absolute monarchy, those can be very powerful and they can they can in time lead to significant reforms of the state and that's exactly what had happened in England. Mm-hmm. So uh, so there are, there are uh, you know, very important considerations here that do somewhat incline me a bit more toward – uh, the state, as opposed to as opposed to the Careful dynamiters, and and when he looks at the two of them and says, "You are equivalent," I see what he's saying, but at the same time, if I had to pick between them, I'm going to pick the state. I think. So I think that the I think that's a good point, which I think brings up an important point up for for libertarians in general, uh, which I would also say for modern political philosophy, uh, who care people who care about legitimacy of the state, as all modern political philosophy is supposed to care about. But when you have these trappings of power, when you have uh, courtly robes and judges who sit you know, four feet above everyone else and, and all these different things, which I, I do think are important, and, and intellectual people will, will sort of poo-poo this. They've been doing it for a long time, like you know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain type of stuff. It's, it's just a, a king in a robe with a lot of jewels. He's still just a man. He's still just a fallible person. But if you're talking about ruling most people – and you have a theory of human nature that says that most people are below average or at least half of them are below average and most people uh, maybe desire to be ruled in some way or most people are not equipped uh, in the way that sort of skeptics and intellectuals are to see through the trappings of power. So give the people what they want. Give them some sort of, of ceremony uh, rather than bombs. And in the end of the day, it's just a function of human nature that you have to give them ceremony rather than bombs, but at least you're not giving them bombs. At well, least you're well, giving them trumpet music and courtly pr- processions and all this other – inauguration parades and all this other stuff. That's that's true to a point. But also what I mean is that when you have regular forms that the government must take when – it is established that we always have elections, when it is established that laws are always registered by the courts, when it is established that uh, term limits are always respected. These are limits on government power. These are limits on the individuals who occupy the offices, and those are meaningful. Those are important. Now, uh, the rituals of government, of course, can be uh, used in an abusive way and, and they can be used to uh, to invest certain people with an air of majesty that presumably they don't deserve and then uh, then uh, from that people uh, may show more deference to their authority and that's a problem. Uh, that's not really what I was, was yeah. trying to get out there. Well, also, well, I also I want to say that you know, there's, there's a difference between what works and what, what works on people and what those people want. And we need to yes. we need to be careful to distinguish that because it may be you can say you know people are drawn towards the the pageantry pageantry of the state they're they're drawn towards the kind of architecture of power in the terms of the judges sit up here and we have all the marble in D.C. and it's very grand um, and and concluding that therefore that's what people want or instead saying that those are those things play into psychological characteristics of human beings and are being consciously used by people who mm-hmm. want to gain and maintain power you know, without people actually wanting to be ruled in this particular way. Yeah, it's think, just this is a way that happens to get people to put up with it more. I'm not, I'm not of course, uh, uh, necessarily making the claim that we should you know, dress up power in, in all the accoutre, accoutrements of, of French kings pre-revolution. But I do think as someone who works on the Supreme Court, for example, uh, which I think has a different sort of type of legitimacy behind it, especially because it's more you know intellectually rigorous. It has to actually write things that explain why it's doing it. And if the Supreme Court held sessions in a shack, at a at a you know fold up table with plastic chairs, 
um, I think that it would it would change how the perception of the court in terms of something that that actually hands down things that are that are worth listening to. I just like I guess I can't immediately decide if that's good or bad. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, neither can I. It's just a, it's an interesting an interesting thing I've thought about before when you sit in the court and see them do this, and in you know as a libertarian, but still feeling somewhat like wow, this is an awesome display of power type of thing. I'm sure even if even if uh, say 50 percent of people are below average, which is definitional, uh, it doesn't necessarily follow that what they need is an absolute ruler over them, and. Uh, I, I think that uh, Oberon Herbert deals with this very, very well when he talks about uh, some of some of the other arguments that are used to justify the power of majorities. So he says he says it's sometimes urged in in defense of power that the part which falls to discontented minorities is to turn themselves into majorities. So if you're if you're unhappy with the majority, what you need to do is if you can't beat them, join them. Basically, mm-hmm. figure out how to make your own majority that will overcome the current majority, and then you wield the power, and then you get to do what you want to do. Uh, he says this uh, remedy has the slight defect of drawing upon an imagined future and ignoring a real present. And uh, when you say, "Well, one day you'll be in the majority," that's uh, that can be pretty cold comfort to groups that have almost always been minorities. Uh, that's uh, you know, in the history of Europe, if you look at uh, if you look at Jews or gypsies uh, or uh, you know gays or lesbians, you know these people. African Americans, you know, you know, United there, States. Yeah. There will there will be there will be minorities no matter what. And saying, "Hey, you just need to join the majority." That's cold comfort. Well, and it's also it's. I mean, it seems like it's the wrong answer, too. I mean, even if it – we set aside the issue of how realistic it is that these majorities who are being beat up on right now – or these minorities who are being beat up on right now could eventually become majorities. The, the notion that if you're being beat up on, the way to solve it is to the, become – is, is to yes. get the power to start yeah. beating people up when in fact – seems obvious that the way to solve it is to simply have people stop beating each other up. Yes, beating up is the problem. It's not the solution. It's right. not it's not the uh, the end state here. It's it's the thing that we're trying to get rid of. Yeah, the the line that he uses uh and you might have been just about to read this Jason uh when he says the cold comfort of that you might be in the majority in the future he says it can hardly unhang a man or wipe out of existence the week he, has, weeks he has spent in prison, or give back property that has been taken from him and spent, or build up some great voluntary institution which has been destroyed, or invent redress for restrictions placed upon facilities of an individual during the best years of his life, or remove the twist it has given to the national character by unwise and harsh measures. It's a very interesting passage about about the kind of injustices that we talk a lot about here, whether it's drug war, imprisonment, or being locked in a public school, uh, in a failing public school, which of course affects your entire life and how much you can do with your life. And it can hardly be like, well, it's time for you to get into the majority and figure out how to fix schools as opposed to something that where we say stop doing this stuff to people. Yeah, I mean, Herbert Dressy brings up exactly this idea of kind of the, the oddity of saying violence is the proper solution to violence um, he 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 says he asks us to imagine i'm 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 walking along a road and some stranger then knocks me down and begins to cudgel me about the head. Um, I call to a passerby to help me and to drag the villain off. He stands, however, with his hands in his pocket and cheerfully tells me that it is all right that I ought not to object. If I only practice the use of the cudgel myself with sufficient zeal for a month or perhaps a year, I shall then be in a position to cudgel my assailant quite as effectively about the head as he is now cudgeling me. I reply that I don't believe in cudgeling heads, whether it is my head or the head of somebody else. The passerby, however, merely shrugs his shoulders by way of telling me that it is idle to object to what is so excellent a custom and one which is universally practiced in the district. This is this is exactly, you know, the, the like... If the government is forced and the problem is we're forcing each other to do things that those people don't want, then what you got to do is just start forcing your will upon others. Yeah, but I mean, it's interesting. We like those examples, and I think it's a great it's a great passage. Um, it's interesting to me that so many people don't like those examples. They think that they're ridiculous analogies, right? Yeah, well, right. Well, but, but the, it's easy to see the appeal of it for someone who has perhaps all their life been a part of a majority. Uh, when you when you live your life in a majority, you will think differently. And 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 Herbert goes on to talk about that. He says that uh, he ca- there's what he calls the national life or national unity argument. This is where 
if you take part in the life of the nation uh, through the state, which is its agent, uh, you will will stand to gain something spiritually, and there's something very you know, useful or or even holy almost about uh, participating in national life and being a part of a thing that is larger than yourself. And nationalists to this day talk about that as as being a great thing. And he has a very interesting and challenging argument against that, and, and that is to invoke uh, Herbert Spencer and and through him also I think Adam Smith in in saying that progress is difference and uh, what that means in in economics is that you have specialization and gains through trade and so uh, when an economy progresses suddenly there is not just a doctor anymore there is a doctor who is a cardiologist and specializes just in one organ of the body and its diseases and its cures. And that's uh, that's progress because there has been more knowledge added and there's now a capability that society didn't have before for people to make progress on, on not just health in a general sense, but on, on all the different capabilities and diseases uh, in particular and with lots more people working on them. And that means that means that there's going to be lots more uh, diversity in society, not just in the, you know, the quota or token sense or you know, filling in this checkbox on the census form, but there's going to be diversity in what people are up to, what they're doing. And, uh, and that ought to be something that on the one hand is, is you know, great in economic terms and great in you know, material culture terms, but also great he says, in terms of the life of the nation. The nation is not going to be great when everyone is the same. It's going to be great when everyone is up to a lot of very different things and, and then they collaborate or they, they coordinate through voluntary and free means. So we, we don't want people using – we don't want majorities using the force of the state or extreme minorities using the force of dynamite to force their preferred version of sameness upon everyone and thereby cutting off this progress – um, but I, I want to. I wonder if the the cudgel example and this violence example that he gives is the best way, or even really gets to the heart of this problem. So let me if you mind looping back around to the the cudgel because so we don't. It's it's wrong to his his thing is it's wrong to beat people over the head with a cudgel, and it's wrong to say you know the solution to being beat over the head is to just build up cudgel skill and beat over the head with the other guy. But if what is the solution then? Because someone's got to stop the cudgeling, mm. right? You know, you can't if, – if you're not going to do it, then that guy's just going to sit there and keep beating you. Mm. So, so first, this, this cudgel is, is not the same thing as limiting the economy or whatever, which – you know, or, or the kinds of things that aren't as explicitly like individual rights. I mean restricting people's economic liberties is a rights violation, but it's a different kind of rights violation, say, than beating someone to the head with a cudgel. Mm. Um, and, and so that's – it seems almost as if the, the cudgel example is precisely the area where counter-cudgeling <laughs> is, is necessary and ought to be done by the state, which then who, – who is that? Well, maybe it could be done by the state or maybe it could be done by culture. I mean I always think of the, the great Oscar Wilde quote where he says something like, we will not succeed in outlawing war by convincing people that it is wicked – we will succeed in outlawing war by convincing them that it is vulgar. Mm, yeah. And uh, uh, in a way, that is a lot of, of uh, what we're after here, Reminds convincing people that, that <laughs> resorting to the political means, resorting to, uh, resorting to force to get what you want out of society is actually the less sophisticated, the less uh, intelligent way to do it. It's, it's vulgar. It's, yeah, that's, it's ugly. I think that's a really good point. As I said, the cigarettes is a good example of that uh, some of the other day. Uh, mentioned to me that isn't, aren't, isn't smoking cigarettes something that poor people do, which aside from being incredibly you. classist as, a, as an incredibly classist type of thing, it's interesting that that's now where it's gone. It's now a vulgarity. Uh, it's not so much wicked. It's just a vulgarity. But I, I think that I can connect um, what Aaron said about cudgeling uh, in terms of what do you do when you get cudgeled because I think that's the proper question to what Jason said about national unity and diversity because what – what we're talking about here, um, if we think about Hobbes and Locke and state of nature arguments that justify the state, wherein the problem is is that you can't combat cudgeling or you might not be able to combat cudgeling. So the, the other question someone might say to us 
uh, if, uh, someone who is attacking libertarianism might say, well, your solution to cudgeling is for someone to go to the gym and lift weights and become stronger in a world of only the strong and the fittest shall survive. Or It'll, hire a guy who Or hire a guy who's to... strong. And so then the people who get cudgeled will be the ones who are A, either stronger or B, have enough money to hire someone who's stronger. Uh, and that's what one thing we would say. Um, but, of course, we believe in protecting – here at Cato, protecting life, liberty, and property, of which, of course, cudgeling is one of them. And you talk about national unity – uh, Jason, when you talked about wait, 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 uh, cudgeling is a form. Of cudgeling is a, is a violation of violation. Problem. Yeah, that's what I meant yes. to say. And and Jason, you brought up the national unity argument of for diversity and that progress is difference. Yeah, that, but he, the a, way a he healthy nation listened. is a nation full of people who are all weird in their particular way, and that means they get good at different things and they have a lot of things though. to offer one another. No, voluntarily, not the, not the voluntarily. Party. Yes, voluntarily. Yeah. Because so his, people develop people develop in the arts or in literature or in business or in science, and all of these things are then resources they can offer to each other in the market. Yeah, and I think that he says this um, in his actual line, Herbert writes, uh, Auberon Herbert writes, it was, however, a truth taught by Mr. Herbert Spencer that most effectively withered the rhetorical foliage of this particular argument when he wrote Progress is Difference. He wrote the doom of many pretentious state undertakings, whether systems of and these are the important ones, religion, education, trade, poor relief, insurance, or any other member of the same unprosperous family. Now, those are all very high-level types of state activity, right? It's not anti-cudgeling work. It's not, it's not basic police work. It's, it's more of the stuff that I've talked about as the primitive, primitivism of politics or John Rawls talks about as, as overlapping consensus or minimally normative type of things. All the things that we can all agree on that maybe the state should do, like which does not include stop all people this. from stop cudgeling. people from cudgeling. Yeah, and it's also it's also uh, writing in advance the doom of communism because communism uh, undertook exactly that sort of uh, economic planning, that sort of uh, making things uniform, the mass projects where you have tens or hundreds of thousands of people working on uh, a project like uh, we're going to build a canal or we're going to build a, a railroad across Siberia. And and uh, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter where, what plans you might have had for your life. You're going to do this now mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, squashing everyone into a, a given mold. And, and these things in time came to seem less and less inspiring and more and more like a joke to the people of the Soviet Union. And that's that's – why it collapsed. Well, that's a, that's a great segue because one of the questions I, I had about uh, the way – the whole theme of this essay that di governing begets dynamiters or dynamiting begets dynamiters or violence begets violence, unjustified use of force begets unjustified uses of force. In communist nations, we did see this interesting thing I think in a more pronounced and known way whereas the character of the government really did affect the character of the people. Right, in the, in, in the sense that – so Herbert makes his argument that the dynamiters learn from the governing class uh, who, who have these bad explanations for why they deserve power. Uh, they learn how to, how to use power with bad explanations too. But similarly, in communist countries, people were constantly you – know, they didn't – these officials, the corrupt officials who they distrusted, the corrupt officials who eroded the social communities that they had grown up, uh, they adopted all those same behaviors they did to try and stab each other in the back. And it was, it was all a big question of who could stab each other in the back the quickest. And they, you could say they learned it from the government or the governing class in the most and, basic sense. And Herbert addresses that, that particular issue of – the state as kind of the, the moral exemplar or perceived moral exemplar and what that does when the state is trying to enforce. He, he calls that argument that the state should be the one to set moral standards and teach us to be moral and whatnot. He calls the people who advocate that state morality people. Um, and he says that in, in their view, the state was the father, mother, and goodness knows what, controlling with its superior wisdom the rash impulses of the children. Um, he, it was replied that the state was not father or mother. So replied by the people arguing against this idea of state morality. It was replied that the state was not father or mother, but it was only one rash set of the children and perhaps not the best, controlling for their own purposes another set of the children, that there was nothing very moral in controlling other people. The worst rulers had always been glad to perform that office for others. 
that what was moral was self-control and that there was no possibility of the compelled man becoming a moral man for he was reduced to the position of a person with his hands tied from whom had been taken the power of choosing the good thing for its own sake. What we see now is, is exactly this process, I think, in the Middle East where uh, if you read what the, the leaders of al-Qaeda uh, have written, they will say – the governments here are illegitimate. We are at war with them. Uh, they are the dynamiters of of today, and and yes, they are reprehensible, and uh, yes, they do horrible things. And yet, I can at least somewhat understand that it is a response to many of the very autocratic regimes that have existed for so long in the Middle East, and that sadly we've done a lot to support. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and 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 the same thing uh, going back to what I said about the Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc uh, countries. Uh, Pete Bedke had written a lot, has written a lot about how much uh, the degradation of the moral character of people comes to play, especially if you have this view of the state morality. People, I mean, I often would like people to have less of a view that the state is an exemplar of morality and take more of that responsibility for themselves. Like when someone tells me that you know the state legalizing drugs is a way of endorsing drugs, I would like people to stop thinking that way as opposed to be like, no, it's the state saying that th- this is not our province. This is not what we are supposed to be doing. It doesn't mean that they're saying that you should go out there and smoke marijuana. If endorsing – uh, drugs is what we do by legalizing drugs, then does the state endorse Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam all at once? Yeah, alcohol, yeah. Uh, I, I don't think that it's possible. I mean that's logically – it's logically absurd. You can't, mm-hmm. you can't you know, subscribe to all of those religions or endorse all of those religions at once. Uh, and, and the same is true with, with drug use. It's, it's not an endorsement. It's just we're going to stop uh, putting you in a box if you do this. Mm-hmm. Right. I think people tend to think that there's a difference – between those kinds of things because people would say like – most people would admit, yeah, there are lots of all sorts of immoral things that one could do that are not illegal and should not be illegal. So it's it's wrong to repeatedly not show up to your kid's concert at school because you want to go to a meeting or – Break promises. Yeah, break promises, like that sort of stuff. Lie to Um, women. But we wouldn't – but most people, even even people who are strongly in favor of drug prohibition um, wouldn't say, well, we should also prohibit that sort of behavior with the state, but there's something different about I guess. drugs I'm that not makes, exactly it, sure what makes it, it is. more of a moral wrong or makes it so that allowing that particular thing is seen as endorsement in a way that um, – and it, it could it be – I mean could it be to some extent them – you know, because the views against more marijuana prohibition, you know, increasing numbers of people see – marijuana use as fine or not any worse than alcohol use or not something the state and so there there is this kind of rising tide of endorsement or at least not moral shaming of this behavior mm-hmm. and and then that's being reflected in a changing policy mm-hmm. and so people are it you know they're 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 getting kind of cause and effect mixed up you know um, and so they're then thinking that if they can if they can stop the effect, stop the, the legalization of marijuana, they can turn back the cause, which is you know the changing moral attitudes mm-hmm. towards it. So they're making a mistake, but at least they're, they, there is a relationship that they're hooking on to. Mm-hmm. So in that mind, mindset about you know how do people view the state? Are they viewing it as a teacher? Or are they do they even care uh, about the justifications of the state? Uh, that that's one that I think is important. Um, one of the things that I think about when I when I read this essay and, and other things like this uh, is whether or not a this resonates at all with people nowadays, or maybe it resonated more then, but nowadays does it resonate with people at all? Does this seem like extremist literature? Uh, is this any good method for rhetorically going about talking about the ideas of liberty to come in here and? Give them an ethics of dynamite and and have people maybe think that you're justifying you know blowing up stuff because you think that's what government does is the, is this our best messaging or should we would, would this be the first thing you gave someone who was interested in libertarianism? It wouldn't be the first thing I would give them, but I think that it's certainly an exemplary piece of libertarian writing. I think that uh, virtually everything that Oberon Herbert says about the dynamiters, libertarians should feel proud about saying 
of terrorists today. Yes, they are evil. They are destructive. This is violence. It is deplorable. It is against everything that I stand for. And yet, where did that come from? Where did that come from? It came from a long experience of despotic, arbitrary government and grievances that could not possibly be addressed under that system. Uh, he talks about how the uh, dynamiter is forged on the official anvil, that uh, what makes people into dynamiters uh, is, in fact, the violence of the state and the experience of the violence. Uh, he says, vexation piled upon vexation, restriction upon restriction, burden upon burden. The dynamiter is slowly hammered out everywhere on the official anvil. And... Uh, if I wanted to say how did how did terrorism come to be, well, I would say this. I would say exactly this, that when there are not uh, institutions to peaceably resolve disputes, when government is arbitrary, when it is uh, acting to censor the press and to establish particular forms of religion and to, to say that others are deviant, uh, yes, you're going to see terrorism. You will see terrorism. This is cause and effect. It's as close as it ever happens in, in the world of politics. This is cause and effect. So it's a blowback argument. Well. In a, in a kind of, inter, you know, a, a different version of it. Uh, not, not just which is for... not to endorse terrorism. I think that oh, it's, yeah, you know, it, I would stress that in the very opening of the essay, Oberon Herbert says that he abhors the means of the dynamiters and then move on from that. Uh, you know, that's the easy call. It's very, very easy to say, yes, these people are, are repellent and I, I reject them entirely. Now, let's move on from that. But it seems like, I mean, the obvious objection here to that, to that idea is that the world has terrorists in it, um, whether there's a state or not, and that there are people out there who want to hurt other people, Does it? whether there's a state or not, and that if you want to uh, protect yourself from people who want to Hurt, take you over. Whether it was um, I'm trying to think of a, a good step, the Roman Empire uh, or something like that, there are people coming in who want to use force to make you behave, and that and, and the state is a very important institution for keeping us protected from those people. Well, I I think that the world might have thieves and might have murderers without the state, but I don't think it would have terrorists. In that sense, really, I, I really don't think so I because think I because terrorism, I think, is a political crime. I think that it is. Well, I think how, that it is we, aimed we're... at taking control of the political means. Uh, this is uh, as as he makes the dynamiter say, as Oberon Herbert, ma Herbert makes the dynamiter say, uh, this is the power of the minority. Resort to dynamite is the power of the minority. Government is the power of the majority. Uh, I'm going to use my power, which is to inflict pain. But I think I think when most people talk about you know when most people are scared of terrorism and, and use that term and you know we need to do something about it, um, it's I want to say there's a different maybe definition at work there of terrorism and I think it's one that that Trevor's point about it still existing in the absence of a state works more with because you're saying you're saying terrorism is is these attempts to use violence to to influence the to political influence process. the political process so, but yeah, I think course, that but one. that's it's people aren't scared. People who are terrified of terrorist attacks aren't scared that someone's going to influence the political process. They're scared right? of being hurt. They're scared of being hurt. I mean, if there's the inf this, the scared of the influencing the political process, the people who want to reform campaign finance and all of that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but but with their so for them, terrorism is more something roughly like you know indiscriminate killing in large numbers, mm -hmm. and that you you could have all sorts of motivations for doing that. You you could be doing it for extortion. You could be doing it simply because you are crazy and yeah. evil and like it, you know, and those sorts of terrorism defined that way would probably exist, you know, no matter what the political structure well, okay. or lack of political Okay, you structure. can define terrorism that way if you like, but I think it loses a lot of its uh, analytical power if you do that. I think I think that means you're lumping in things that are are mass ultimately mass different. So Adam Lanza psychopath. is a different kind of evil from Osama bin Laden. Yeah. Those right, are, but I think, different kinds but of I think evil. Trevor's point is that we can say – people might say, look, that sort of terrorism, this, this like indiscriminate large-scale killing is going to exist you know, whether there's a state or not. And so there, the state you know, may potentially make it worse um, along – in some degree, but not having the state is going to mean no protection from it, is going to make it even worse than it would be with the state there influencing it a little bit. And so we're willing to put up with this the, – the dynamite in the form of 
fancy robes and columns and marble in order to prevent other that, types of violence that, that, sort of violence that aren't the ones that are beget by the state but are the ones that are part of the natural human condition. Right. I mean that's just that's just the social contract. That's mm. John Locke, very exactly. basic stuff. Yeah, and I and I, there's that that is still a very compelling argument. Um, it, it's not the case that all majorities are the same. Um, they're ruling over other types of minorities. Uh, that's why things like the non-aggression principle, right or wrong, as a as a you know the lowest defense of libertarian principles, for example. But you still need something that says this is this is not okay, and this is okay. Like there's it's not like we're trying to protect the minority of of child murder. Because it's the it's the it's a, the type of immorality that they're practicing that is not acceptable, um, and regardless of whether or not they form a political group or anything like that, that is not an acceptable type of morality. So that's why we have a minimal level where we say we need to enforce the basic protections and have something to do that. Let Let me go back to Trevor's question about how good this argument is for convincing non libertarians, and and modify it a bit because it seems like this this argument that. Herbert's making about the government being a, a form of force that's different in some ways but not really all that different from the dynamiter is is similar to a broader kind of argument that libertarians make all the time. So for our, this book club that we read this in, a little while back we read Oppenheimer's The State, which is a, a story about how the state – Emerges from basically bandits who want to steal Stationary stuff. Bandits, yeah, so they, yeah, they you know they can go on raids, but eventually they realize that it's easier and it's more productive to just settle down and rule a group of people and extract money from them in taxation than it is to steal their stuff, burn their houses, and then come back later and do it again. Um, and so in that case, it's the you know he's telling a story of the government as thieves, um, and Herbert is telling a story of the government as effectively murderers, um, or at least people engaging in physical assault. And so this this story of the government as actually a I guess a criminal act or a criminal organization is one that libertarians, you know, Murray Rothbard wrote an essay called The Anatomy of the State, which makes these same sorts of claims. Um, this is a pretty common libertarian argument. And and is that one that works for people who are not already libertarians? Well, it's not going to work all by itself, but if you do uh, present this and then say, we also have another model, a legitimate government would not be a group of stationary bandits. It would not be a group of of uh, majoritarians with a cudgel. It would be a service provider, a a provider of a service that you want for which you will be willing to pay taxes. Uh, or for which you will be willing to make voluntary contributions. And this is precisely the voluntarism that Herbert. This is endorses. Herbert's voluntarism, which we haven't had enough time to get into. But a a voluntarily financed government that was very strictly limited in its powers, as an alternative to uh, a majority that can do whatever that whatever it feels like. That's I think a much better alternative. When you when you give people no alternatives between the state and the dynamiters, of course they're going to choose the state. But but what we need to do is give them a third choice. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that you can't make these arguments uh, by themselves. That the, the, all all these sort of vectors uh, of both the possibilities of the free market and the effectiveness of various things versus the dangers of the state and the ineffectiveness of – they have to be brought together. But I do think that it is important for us – these kind of essays bring back the question of why is there a state anyway? And, and anyone who's at all dealt with political philosophy uh, shouldn't take that as an obvious question. Unfortunately, we do. Um, well, at least a question with an obvious answer. An obvious answer, yeah. Because – and that's – I think that's a danger of modern political discourse. I think that Enlightenment era philosophers said, well, the state is kind of loosely justified uh, to do a few things, but it needs justification because it is force and therefore – and force like that needs justification. We don't talk about that anymore. And in fact, uh, we are looked at as crazy people. If we bring it up, we're just like, well, why is the state justified? And people will look at us, you know, people who aren't libertarian and, and who's like we're extremists when actually we are ex explaining a mainstream, the main current of political philosophy since Thomas Hobbes. And I'll and just, pop in, reason, yeah. just pop in to note that um, a few episodes back, we did a podcast with Jason Brennan on the legitimacy of the state and these questions. So if you're curious about this complex question of 
justification for the state. I encourage you to listen to that episode. Yeah, and it comes up it comes up a lot in our discussions here. But I mean, I think it's a point that's worth making time and time again. Uh, there is an intuitive. Uh, there, it, the state is not intuitive. I, I think in the way, and if you bring things like this up, if people have never heard this before, that I think most people would say, "Well, that's an interesting point." And they might think about it more and then at least return the question to why is this thing existing? What is it supposed to do? Is it authorized to do anything? I mean once it gets authorized, once it gets off the ground, is it any, anything goes after this? I mean, NSA spying to drug prohibition to all these things? Or can we formulate an idea that says that there's a problem with NSA spying, there's a problem with marijuana prohibition, there's a problem with certain types of laws that is based on the fact that the state is at best loosely justified. And that's where I think these arguments come in valuable. But it shouldn't be the first thing you give it because people are so awash with this that they don't really think about the state that way. So I did have one extra little thing I wanted to, wanted to close with. In the latter part of the essay, Herbert comes in with a lot of sort of examples of, of – kind of how poor the state is at doing some things. And this is where I thought you have these these 100-year-old essay, 120-year-old essay that is still talking about problems today. And, and some of them that, that particularly struck me were um, the uh, – he talks about how uh, in Paris, there's a – he quotes a law professor talking about holding the state accountable. In France, these actions – to which a government is a party, are tried in special administrative courts and by special administrative rules, that these courts have a strong official bias and actions laid by private individuals against state officials rarely succeed. Uh, this is something I, I thought was amazing in terms of uh, cops being exonerated recently for killing people in cold blood in the street uh, because cops hardly ever get uh, accused of any of those crimes. There's a, there's a lot of interesting things that he brings up. There's another one about um, the the – Inefficiency of the courts, which is something that I think is – that libertarians think about in terms of how much the, the state providing courts, but maybe it does it poorly in a way that we should reassess, said uh, uh, in Paris, he says there is but one police court for the 20 20- – counties of sections of Paris, about 200 cases are taken at each sitting, which lasts from an hour to and a half to three hours. This only gives about one minute per each case. And if anyone's ever been to county court or, or knows a public defender, that's about as much time as you get to defend <laughs> yourself against the state. I mean, he's, he's really hitting on a bunch of really interesting problems here. And, and it it's also goes well beyond the courts. I mean, there's, there's a lot of other what he calls petty tyrannies that the state imposes. Uh, he says, uh, an unfortunate seaside resident may not go out and dip his bucket into Great Father Ocean and carry off water for his bath, as such liberty might interfere with the revenue derived from salt. Salt was a commonly taxed commodity and doing a completely harmless action like taking a bucket of seawater out of the ocean, uh, Mm -hmm. which is obviously renewable at that scale infinitely. Uh, That was prohibited. Or he says, the petty tyranny which forbids a child being called by a new name, which we still, still to this day encounter in a lot of countries, uh, countries in Europe will forbid children from having unusual names. Oh, that's true. Yeah, they're name lists. I know Denmark has one. I think Germany has yes. one. That yes. is like prohibited official. You have to get approved by the government, which is astounding to us. Those are the petty tyrannies, which I think affect some of the sociology of the state and maybe how many we're willing to accept in the first place. And, and well, I, I might not necessarily say it's a wise idea to, to name your child a numeral or a punctuation mark. Uh, at the same time, I really doubt that this is something that the state needs to be involved in. We've run out of time, but I think we've, we've managed to cover a good deal of what's in this essay. So let's, let's close the same way that Herbert does with his, his terrific last bit here. When he writes, we may be quite sure that force users will be force begetters. The passions of men will rise higher and higher and the authorized and unauthorized governments, the government of the majority and of written laws, the government of the minority and of dynamite will enter upon their desperate struggle of which no living man can read the end. In one way and only one way can the dynamiter be permanently disarmed by abandoning in almost all directions our force machinery and accustomizing the people to believe in the blessed weapons of reason, persuasion, and voluntary service. We have morally made the dynamiter. We must now morally unmake him. I want to thank Jason for joining us today and thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this 
more book club style episode of Free Thoughts. And I, it, I hope you'll let us know what you thought of it. Um, and if you have suggestions for texts we should read and discuss, books or essays, please send them our way. You can find me on Twitter at A Ross P. That's A R O S S P. And you can find me on Twitter at T C Burris, T C B U R R U S. You can find me at Twitter at uh, J A S O N K U Z N I C K I. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.